features during the Q&A, during the Q&A session. And by entering, you are consenting to your likeness possibly appearing in the promotional materials for the Los Angeles Public Library. Next slide, please. So my name is Shirley and I'll, I'll be today's moderator for today's NASI program. And I'm from the Lincoln Heights Branch Library. Uh, we are a neighborhood science library, which means that we have neighborhood science kits for our patrons to check out and take home. If today's program inspires you to become a more active science partner, please come by. You can follow us on Instagram and Facebook and it's listed on the slide. Next slide, please. So now onto NASI Tuesdays. NASI, in case you wondered, is short for neighborhood science. Neighborhood science has many names. It is most commonly known as citizen science, but it may also be called community science, crowdsource science, contributory science, and even street science. It is basically research that is conducted by non-scientists, non-professionals, or ordinary people like you and me. You don't need to be an A student in science or math. You also don't need to have a science background or degree. You just need to have curiosity about the world around you. NASI Tuesdays is a weekly program series about learning and contributing to science and sustainable practices in and for your neighborhood. Next slide, please. This year's NASI Tuesdays program series runs from March 22nd to April 26th. If you enjoy our program today, don't forget to check out and register for upcoming program topics at the link above. To register, you can also simply scan the QR code or go to bit.ly slash nasi twos, as you can see on the screen. Next slide. And today's program is all about mosquitoes. We will be learning from our guest speakers about the mosquitoes that have made California and LA their home. How changing climate is aiding their spread and what we can do to make our environment less mosquito friendly. You will also find out how to put your selfie skills to work and help NASA identify mosquito larvae that can prevent outbreaks of mosquito-borne disease. You will also find out how you can help scientists monitor and identify potential mosquito habitats in your communities and contribute to real scientific research with your smartphone. Next slide. Now let's introduce today's amazing presenters. And Dr. Rosanne Rusty Lowe is a climate scientist and educator at the Institute for Global Environmental Strategies, who works at the forefront of citizen science and its application for mosquito-borne diseases such as Zika, West Nile virus, and I think I hope I'm pronouncing this right, dengue, dengue. She's a science lead for the Globe Observer Mosquito Habitat Mapper mobile app. Using, using this free mobile app, citizen scientists of all ages can work together with NASA scientists to reduce the outbreak of mosquito-borne disease in their community. Greg Mercado is an education program coordinator for the Greater Los Angeles County Vector Control District. Uh, he enjoys being an EPC because he gets to meet and interact with the community and spread awareness on health and well being. Fun fact he never orders from the menu. He tells the waiter to surprise them with any plate or the waiter's personal favorite dish. And our last presenter is Liliana Moreno. She is one of the education program coordinators at the Greater Los Angeles County Vector Control District. She enjoys educating and spreading awareness about mosquitoes to residents all over LA County but her most favorite part of her job is visiting and teaching students about the deadliest animal in the world. For fun, she enjoys going to music concerts and road trips to explore new places. And now without further ado, let's welcome Dr. Rusty Lowe, Greg and Liliana. Hello everyone, pleasure meeting everyone here. My name is Greg. And so yeah, so uh, yeah, let's begin with today's presentation about mosquitoes. I've been seeing the, uh, the on a chat box that we're, all, we're coming from all over the place. 
We're coming from Brazil, coming from South Dakota, different parts of LA, like Silver Lake, Granada Hills, and uh, so many other places uh, out there. And we all have the same common problem, mosquitoes, right? And an insect that we're all grossed out by, as well as cockroaches. But, you know, mosquitoes, wow, they are, they are very, very dangerous animals. And we're going to tell you why they're so dangerous. So I'm going to, uh, we're going to begin this presentation together and exactly show you guys why mosquitoes are known as the world's most deadliest animals. And I oh, lost it right here. So yeah, when we say like the world's most deadliest animals, sometimes a lot of people think um, most likely it will be a shark, a hippo, a lion, but not a mosquito, right? And yeah, mosquitoes, um, if you guys were to guess, like if you guys would write in a chat box, how many people do you think die every year because of mosquitoes? Yeah, you know, sometimes uh, in the chat, like let's see in the chat right now, I, I'm seeing you guys responding, responding, that's perfect. 57, one says, another one says a million, 3 million, 400. So yeah, those are all high numbers, but yeah, the, the is actually 800,000 to a million every year around the whole world, people die from mosquitoes. And that's what makes them the world's most dangerous animal. And that's because of all the diseases they can transmit, such as Zika, Dengue, Malaria, West Nile, and so much more. So my name is Greg McCardo and with me, um, I have Liliana Moreno. We're, we're going to talk to you guys about everything about mosquitoes, from knowing how to protect yourself from mosquitoes, uh, and learning about the biology of mosquitoes, and then how to reduce and control the mosquito population. And at the end, we're going to go over some um, cool little resources for you guys. And I'll eat, the cool thing about it is that we're going to have a little, little, uh, little questions, a couple, little, couple little questions for you guys to see if you guys could answer to your best of your ability. So, the first thing to understand is protection training, right? And that is really important, right? Because no one doesn't want to get bit by mosquitoes. Uh, let's see, I'm, how many times have you guys gotten bit by mosquitoes? I know last time uh, I went to a pool and I got bit 40 times. If you guys want to uh, text me on the chat box of how many times you guys got bit, what's the most you ever got bit, then we could definitely get an idea of how annoying they are. Yeah, I know, um, yep, exactly, Marcia, you too as well, exactly. And some of you guys, too much to count, exactly. There's so many bites out there that we get and these mosquitoes are so tiny. That's what's so hard to, uh, to even see them sometimes. So the best thing to do is to apply mosquito repellent on exposed skin. And you wanna apply it anywhere where your skin is showing. So let's say, for example, if you're wearing shorts or sandals, you wanna make sure that you apply some even on your ankles and feet because mosquitoes, they like to fly low and bite your ankles. And so, so some of those mosquitoes are known as ankle biters. Now, what about the face? You can't forget about the face, right? So you wanna make sure that you apply mosquito repellent on your palms and just gently pat your face. You also want to remember to wear loose fitted clothing to cover exposed skin because mosquitoes are really tiny. To get an idea how small they are, if you guys should look at your nail and your pinky finger, they're about smaller than that. They're one fourth of a size of a quarter. So they could definitely penetrate through tight clothing. That's why we recommend loose fitted clothing to cover your exposed skin. Now, mosquitoes can find us from something we breathe out, and that is CO2, also known as carbon dioxide. So if you're outside and you're being active, having the time of your life, just you know being in the outdoors and you're breathing heavy, or well, you're breathing CO2, carbon dioxide. And as soon as the mosquitoes senses that, then they know there's a blood mirror near, nearby and they can definitely get a bite out of you. Now, unfortunately, mosquitoes are active all year round, but the most active in spring, summer, and in fall. Now we, uh, we're gonna uh, give you guys a quick little tour on the biology of mosquitoes and a little bit more about what they do and what makes them so dangerous and the life cycle and the stages. So let's go inside here and just kind of, let's go stumble across these microscopes. Microscopes that we have all the way in the back, right over here. So let's take a little virtual tour and just use our imaginations that we're gonna be learning about the mosquitoes through the lenses of a microscope. And we have our video right here to show you guys right here. So learn about the anatomy of the mosquito. The, the mosquito has three major body parts. And we're gonna start from the bottom and then work our way all the way to the top. So starting right here at the bottom, we have the abdomen. And the abdomen is, uh, is responsible for protecting the three stomachs of the mosquito. Now, next to the abdomen, we have the thorax of the mosquito. And the thorax kind of acts as an engine and helps the mosquito 
moves his wings and his legs in the direction it wants to go. Now, next to the, uh, the, uh, the thorax, we have the head of the mosquito. And on the head of the mosquito, we have the compound eyes. And the compound eyes, if you take a look at it, it actually is many little lenses all clumped up together and makes a big compound eyeball. And that allows a mosquito to have a 360 degree view. So they can see in every angle and every direction. So it really uh, makes it hard for them to, uh, uh, for, it makes it hard for us to see them and, and even hit them because they're flying all around us. They can see us from uh, far away. Now above the compound eyes, we have the antenna. And the antenna is responsible for sensing a particular smell that we breathe out. Now, if you guys remember, something we breathe out, especially when we're being active, CO2, carbon dioxide, well, that's what they're sensing for. And as soon as they get that sense, they're gonna bite us, right? But they're gonna bite us with their proboscis, which is right here, this long needle mouth. And this long needle mouth actually has six. Yeah, six proboscis. So let's see exactly what each proboscis, uh, what the, each needle mouth does when it comes to proboscis. So let's do a quick little countdown in three, two, one. And you see the proboscis opened up and now we see the six needle mouths. Let's see what each one does. And so the first and second needle mouth, which is on the outside, these, these two right here, it's gonna cut into your skin like a saw. Then the third and fourth needle mouth, which is this one, and this one, it's gonna hold the skin open. And then the fifth needle mouth, this one here, it's gonna pierce our skin, and then it's gonna uh, leave saliva, they leave the saliva on our skin, and that causes that allergic reaction. That allergic reaction to us is what causes those itchy red bumps. And then the sixth needle mouth, this one here, it's gonna pierce right through our skin and then take out our blood. And remember how we were talking about the thorax earlier? how it looks like a, an engine and it acts like an engine for a mosquito. Well, that's actually how it looks like right here, where it helps move his wings and his legs in the direction it wants to go. Now with the abdomen, it's protecting the three stomachs. I mean, that'd be kind of cool if we had three stomachs. We only have one, but mosquito has three stomachs. So uh, one stomach is gonna be for water. A second stomach is gonna be for nectars, such as sugars. And then a third stomach is gonna be for blood. I mean, can you imagine having three stomachs? My goodness, that'd be so cool. I think I would definitely have a stomach for like cheeseburgers, another one for pizza and, and all this other cool things, right? But yeah, like we were saying, mosquito, they have it only for, let's see if you guys remember, water, nectars, and blood. Now, I have um, two mosquitoes right here and I'm gonna, I'm gonna see if you guys see any differences. So definitely type in a chat box if you guys see any differences between both of these mosquitoes. So maybe it could be, uh, yeah, just, I'll give you guys a couple of seconds. Yeah. So just type away. Well, I see that one, you guys said that uh, uh, one has some spots, exactly. The one on the left has some spots. Uh, ooh, I saw that Erica mentioned that the antennas are different. What, what differences do you see between antennas? Does anyone see a difference between antenna? Oh, I see that one also even said that one is bigger. Exactly, the one is on the right is bigger. Um, when it comes to antenna, I saw that some of you guys are even mentioning that the one of the antennas, the antennas on the left is a lot more fuzzier and hairier than the one on the right. So those are the differences that can be seen between both mosquitoes, but sometimes it's not what you see, but it's what you feel. And that is that only one of the bites and the one that bites are the female mosquitoes. So only female mosquitoes do the biting. Male mosquitoes don't bite us at all. At all. And when it comes to biting and why do they bite us? Well, that's where Miss L, Liliana is gonna help you out with that because she knows all about that. All right, so now that you have learned all about the anatomy of the mosquito, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about the species around the world. There are over 3000 mosquito species all around the world. But there are two here in California that we are most concerned about and that is the Culex mosquito and the 80s mosquito. And the reason that is, is because those are the mosquitoes that we have here in California and that can transmit diseases to us. The Culex mosquito, there are some major differences between the two. You see the Culex mosquito on the left is more brown, whereas, and then the 80s mosquito is black with white stripes. They're both very tiny and they both go through the same life cycle. Well, actually all species of mosquitoes go through the same life cycle. But another difference between the two is the time of day that they like to come out and bite us. The Culex mosquito, the brown mosquito, will come out to bite us early in the morning or late in the evening, where the 80s mosquito is a daytime biter. 
it bites us all day long. Now, I know you're from all around the world. A lot of you are from all around the world, but people here in California, have you noticed that it hasn't been until the last couple of years that we're getting bit all day? You're like, well, what's going on? Why are there so many mosquitoes now? Well, in fact, that's because the 80s mosquito is invasive to California, and it got here just some years ago, and that's because we're seeing them more now, because they're spreading all over LA County, and they're biting us all day long, where the q -like mosquito is native to California, meaning it's always been around, and the q -like, as you recall, it only comes out to bite us early in the morning or late in the evening. Now, they both go through the same life cycle, as I mentioned before, and here you have different images of the mosquito life cycle, but there are actually only four stages to the mosquito life cycle. First, I'm going to start with the egg. The, the first stage is the egg. Now, you see here the Culex mosquito, it actually lands on water and it lays its eggs individually. The eggs are very, very small. They're actually in the shape of a grain of rice, but a lot smaller than that. And the Culex mosquito will lay its eggs up on, on water, on standing water, and the eggs will actually stick together and form what is called an egg raft. Now, I want you to think of an egg raft, egg raft similar to like a boat floating in water. Now, the 80s mosquito, it lays its eggs individually, also very tiny, but these eggs don't stick to each other. They actually stick along the surface of containers and items. So if there's items left in your backyard, whether it's a toy, a pet bowl, a tarp, anything that could potentially hold water, an 80s mosquito can actually go and lay its eggs in there. Both the culex and the 80s mosquitoes can lay anywhere between 100 to 300 eggs at a time. Now, the second stage of the mosquito life cycle is the larva. They look very similar and they have the three major body parts, which is the head, the thorax, and that long body part is the abdomen. But what you see at the end of the abdomen, what kind of looks like a little tail, it actually works as the nose for the mosquito, and that's called the siphon. Now, in the second stage of the life cycle, the larval stage, the, the larva lives in water, and that's standing water specifically. Well, why does it live in water? Well, that's because this is the stage where it eats. It eats all the algae and bacteria, and it just swims around in the water. Have you noticed that the, the larva is actually kind of hanging upside down at the surface of the water. Well, remember their siphon? They actually swim all the way to the surface of the water to gasp for air, and then they wiggle back down. So this is a stage where they actually eat and feed and, and live in the water. Now, just a couple of days later, they become a pupa. Now in the pupa stage, they continue to live in the standing water, but they're no longer feeding or eating. They're just basically doing gymnastics. That's why they're also known as tumblers. They're tumbling in the water. And as I mentioned, they're not eating. They're just in the water. But if you notice, they're at the surface of the water. Well, fun fact, that's because the pupa, it weighs less than water. And I want you to think of the pupa stage similar to, the, um, to a cocoon. So I want you to think of it like, you know, how the butterfly will live in its cocoon and then break out of its shell. Well, the same thing with the mosquito. The pupa stage, it'll live in it before it breaks out of its shell and becomes an adult mosquito. So as I mentioned, there are four stages to the life cycle, and it's with the, it starts with the egg, the first stage, the larva being the second stage, the pupa being the third, and then the adult mosquito. Now, you guys can look tell me in the chat box if you if can you tell me what species of mosquito this is. Is this the Culex mosquito or is this the 80s mosquito? Well, this is remember the colors. This is the 80s mosquito. Very good. Yes, because it's black and white stripes. 
So you're able to distinguish between the two because of their, their distinct colors. So now that you've learned all about the, the anatomy and the life cycle of the mosquito, what is the thing that you can do to eliminate that? Well, you want to eliminate standing water because mosquitoes need as little as a tablespoon of water to go through their entire life cycle. Without the water, they can't go through their entire life cycle. So you want to eliminate any containers, any um, storage containers that you may have forgotten and left in your backyard, buckets, toys, if it can hold water, it can breed mosquitoes. And in LA, we don't get a lot of rain throughout the year, but if you have these items sitting in your yard, whether it's for weeks, months, up to a year, it can accumulate water, and mosquitoes are very good at finding these sources and laying their eggs and infecting your yard with mosquitoes. Now, you can learn more by visiting our website at mosquitoswaltlab.org or glamosquito.org. And also, we have um, a lot of resources available on our website. We have a really fun music video, and we also have our social media. So you can always follow us at Mosquito Swalt Lab. Mr. Uh, Greg, you're on mute. All right, thank you so much. Uh, so yeah, no, definitely, um, if you guys wanna follow us more, we'll definitely leave our social media platform on our on the chat box for you guys. And we look forward to hearing more from our fellow colleagues and, and presenters. All right, I think um, let's go ahead and welcome Dr. Rusty Lowe. Well, thank you very much. This is so much fun, and um, I really, I really, really enjoyed the the talk today by Gregory and Liliana. And today, we're just um, I'm going to just talk a little bit more about what you can do to protect yourself from mosquitoes by being a scientist. So, when I first was asked to do this the librarians had said, here are some of the questions that people are really interested in. And maybe you can answer these questions. So I'm gonna be talking about why NASA studies mosquitoes, what it has to do with climate change, why they need data from, from citizen scientists. What is that? What is the information that science, citizen scientists give us? What does it look like? And what do they do with the data? And then I'm going to show you how to get involved and maybe collect some data as citizen scientists yourselves. So the first question is, why is NASA studying mosquitoes? And the answer is, most people think that NASA is most interested in space, right? We, we, you know, we have telescopes looking at other worlds. We have, we, we have interest in the moon, the other planets. But most people don't know that most of NASA science is looking at, at our favorite planet, which is the Earth. And so the mosquitoes are one part of the Earth system. And it helps us when we look at what happens with the climate and with weather, mosquitoes respond to it. So it's a way that we can sort of see how things are changing just by watching mosquitoes. And the other question that you asked was, what do mosquitoes have to do with climate change? And the answer is a lot. They don't make climate change, right? But they respond to it. And I, I don't know if anybody here is old like me, but if you were around in 1970, um, you might be living, you might be experiencing a much longer mosquito season than you had when um, back in the old days. So for instance, there are some places in the States where you have uh, mosquitoes for more than a week longer than you did since 1980. So the mosquito seasons start earlier and end later because it's warmer. The other thing, and this is something that Liliana and Gregory talked about, are these hitchhiking species, these species that don't belong here, but they've come here 
and they've invaded. So for instance, they're, one of those bad 80s mosquitoes they talked about is from Asia and they got here on lucky bamboo plants. You know, the eggs were on there and then they, they grew and they came out and they began to live all over the US. Now we have them everywhere. They also came over in tires and used tires from Asia. And then there also the, um, there's another uh, bad mosquito which comes from Africa. And it also, it hitchhiked on boats. So these hitchhiking species are coming um, from where they were and they're coming into this area. And they, before, before the climate changed, it was no big deal, they would just die. But what we're seeing is that some of these mosquitoes now are actually able to, even though they were subtropical or tropical species, they're, we're now finding them in the north of the US and they're able to live there because it's just a little bit warmer and it's warm enough that they can live there. And so what happens now is we call it the range of the mosquito. The mosquitoes are able to live further north and further south than they ever did before. So by watching mosquitoes and where we find them and when we find them, we're learning about our climate changing. And another question people asked was, if NASA has so many satellites, why do they need other data? And the answer is that the, the information that they get from satellites is really important. It can tell us about what's happening all over the world when it comes to, to rain and when it comes to temperature. But at the same time, we need to know what's happening on the ground. And what we do is we can use citizen science data from NASA citizen science programs to uh, make sure that the data that we're getting from the satellites is correct. And you know, maybe um, tweaking it a little bit so we get it so we can able more able to interpret that information correctly. So that's what this information is really important for when it comes to NASA science. And of course, the last thing is you really can't see mosquitoes from space, right? So even though they can predict where the rainfall is just right for mosquitoes and where the temperature is right for mosquitoes, and they can use that information to come up with models to tell people in LA, okay, you might be having a mosquito outbreak soon. They don't know for sure. And so we need people on the ground, citizen scientists to say, yep, you're right. We just found those mosquitoes. So it's a really, it's kind of a way of validating and verifying some of that NASA data. Now people have asked uh, Vivian and our other hosts today, what, what does the citizen science data look like? And because we're asking citizen scientists to take pictures of mosquitoes, uh, these are pictures of mosquitoes. Now these don't look like any of the mosquitoes that you just saw from Liliana or Gregory. Does anybody know why? What's different about these mosquitoes here? And I, I can't see the chat, but maybe you could write in the chat what you think these are. Why are these different? And um, I'll just give you one second. But you can see these are all mosquitoes, but they all look really different. And they look different because they're different species. And the answer is because these are mosquito babies. These are the larva. And this is that, you know, the baby mosquitoes, once they come out of the egg, they live in the water and that's where they grow until they become strong enough that they can become adults and then they fly away. So uh, in our mosquito um, citizen science program, and this is really important, we don't ask you to take pictures of, light, of adult mosquitoes because then you know, you're close to an adult mosquito and maybe they'll bite you. But we're asking you to take pictures of baby mosquitoes, the larvae, and they are, not, they are harmless. So that's really important to remember. Okay, so this is the data. This is a plot of all the data that we've gotten. So do you see the United States there in the map? Well, if you do, I did a little, um, I took a, a close up and the close up map on the left is of LA County. And you can see that there've been a lot of citizen scientists in LA County that have contributed mosquito measurements and observations to Globe Observer. So I wanna thank all of you that have checked out kits from the library and given us your observations. You can see how important it is. And you can see that in California, we're getting a lot of density here because of your work. 
but worldwide, there are more than 84 countries that have contributed mosquito data and about 34,000 observations. So this is what our mosquito data looks like. Now, another question that was posed to me uh, by your librarian is what kind of science it does, does this data, how is it used by scientists? And there are a lot of different ways. And I'm gonna talk just about two or three of these really quickly. But the one is to talk about finding where we can find those new invasive species, those 80s mosquitoes that Ms. Liliana and Gregory were talking about. The second thing, is artificial intelligence. Is anyone familiar? Have you heard about artificial intelligence as um, it's a, using a computer to actually recognize things? They call it actually, um, uh, they call it computer vision. So the, the computer can actually recognize patterns and you have to have lots and lots and lots of pictures so they can recognize pictures accurately. So citizen scientists are people that can provide thousands and thousands of mosquito pictures. And we can use that to then train the model to, or the uh, train the computer program so that it can recognize those mosquitoes. So that's the second thing that we're doing with this data. And the third one I've already talked about, and that is we use that ground-based data from citizen scientists to help interpret and understand what we're seeing from space. So there's three ways that your data is used by NASA scientists and scientists around the world. Okay, I just wanted to show you that the, um, this, the tool is pretty easy to use and um, children are able to use it with their parents. And once children are turned 13, they're able to even use it by themselves. And here you can see a child here. This is a child in Kenya, in Africa. Those two girls there are found in the Caribbean. The girls up on the upper right, they're both girls from Thailand. And this young man right there, he is um, also from the Caribbean. So we have kids all around the world that are contributing their data to, mos to uh, the Mosquito Habitat Mapper. And you can see there's a little plastic bag there on the right hand side. And that little plastic bag has mosquito babies in it. And you can see those larvae and they're hanging by their tails um, and they're breathing through that long tube they have at the end. And they just hang there and they eat with their mouth at the bottom where their head is and they breathe through their, um, what was the word that you used, uh, Gregory? The abdomen, they, they're breathing through the, the, their bottom part. Okay, great. So I'm gonna show you just a couple examples of how your data is used. So look at this wanted part, poster, wanted, dead or alive. Here's one of those 80s that we just talked about, another one of those bad 80s mosquitoes. This is 80 scapularis. 80 scapularis has not been in the US for more than 75 years. And um, scientists looked at precipitation, they looked at temperature and they said, and if you look at this map here, there's Florida here at the edge, and here's, the, here's Mexico and Cuba, and their map um, that, that comes from their model says, we are gonna find this mosquito in the US, in, in um, Louisiana and Florida, because the conditions there are now right for this mosquito. And sure enough, I'm really proud to say that a mosquito citizen scientist found the first example of 80 scapularis in Florida. So you can see that the work you're doing as citizen scientists is really important. You could write a big scientific paper about the first appearance of this non-native invasive species that we found in Florida. So that's one great example of how this data is used. So mosquitoes are moving all over the place. And in Africa, for instance, there is a new um, invasive mosquito. We don't have it here, so you don't have to worry about it, but it's a mosquito that causes malaria. And it just was found here in um, Ethiopia uh, between 2012 and 2019. 
So mosquitoes are on the move. They're hitchhiking on boats. They're hitchhiking in cars. They're hitchhiking on lucky bamboo plants and moving around the world, finding new people to bite and new places to raise their babies. I wanted to tell you a little bit, this is, looks a little bit formal, um, but this is uh, myself and a bunch of scientists that I get to work with every day. And we are working with um, looking, trying to find um, mosquitoes using computers, using our pictures to try and find the very first appearance of this really dangerous malaria mosquito. And so on the bottom, you'll see some pictures of mosquitoes that our citizen scientists have actually contributed using the Mosquito Habitat Mapper app. And on this slide here, I can show you that this is a map of where we found mosquitoes in containers. And I know Liliana was talking about how these 80s mosquitoes you have in uh, California, you can find them in toys and in, in plant pots and in of water buckets and all kinds of food. I think she also said animal bowls. And yeah, it's the same here too. Now, the thing that's really interesting is that you probably have heard of malaria. It's a really bad mosquito disease that can be deadly if not treated. And um, what's really interesting is using our special superpower, which is this mosquito um, computerized recognition, computerized training, we were able to identify one of these invasive mosquitoes using citizen science data. And so that's what this picture is telling you that before in this part of Africa, we never had this mosquito and it really looks like we found it. So this is early news. We have to confirm this. We have to get some gene, genetic material, run that through and make sure our model's right but it's very exciting how technology and how computers are now being used with mosquitoes to help solve the problem of people getting diseases from mosquitoes. So now I still have a few minutes left and I just wanted to tell you about that you too can use the Globe Observer app. So I really hope you'll go to your library and check out one of those kits and um, we'd like you to uh, collect data using this tool. And it's pretty easy to use. I can't show you everything today, but I can show you enough that you can see that it's something that you really can do. We have four tools on the Globe Observer platform, and I'm talking about two of them today, the Globe Observer Mosquito Habitat Mapper and also the Globe Observer Land Cover Tool. And we'd like you to use both of these because we don't, we want to know what kind of mosquito you have, that's the habitat mapper, and where it's found. What is the, you know, is it near a house? Is it, is it near a pool? Is it in the woods? That information we can get from that other tool, the land cover tool. So there's just, it's pretty easy how to use these tools. Basically, you go to a place where you might have mosquitoes, maybe it's a pond, maybe it's an old tire. And we ask you to photograph that, that place where mosquitoes might be found, the tire, using the app. And then if you have time, we'd like you to take a, a bulb syringe, a turkey baster, or maybe just a cup, sample the water, look at it and see if there's larvae in there. And then you can um, report whether or not you found larvae. You can say, I found five larvae, I found one larvae, there's lots of larvae. And then last, take a picture of the surrounding area using the land cover tool. So that's really pretty easy. So there are four steps. I'm gonna show these to you quickly. The first one you describe is where is the water found? Is it found in a tire? Or is it found maybe in a tree hole? Or is it found in a pond? So we have a bunch of different places that you can say where you found the water. So that's the most important thing. Then we ask you if you would like to look at the water and actually see if you see mosquitoes. And if you want to, we ask you to count them. And then we ask you, do you want to identify the mosquito you have? And if you get one of those um, of those really cool uh, microscopes today, I really hope you'll take the take the opportunity to identify larvae. But you can also uh, get the little clip on from your library as well and do it. 
And so you'll, you can just look at our key and the key will help you say, you know, this one here at the top um, that you see with the circle around the great big long breathing tube, that's a Culex. The one with the short blunt breathing tube, that's an 80s. And the one with no breathing tube is a um, Anopheles, which we don't have very many of those. Um, we have some, but not it's not a big problem in the States and they don't carry diseases in the States right now. And then the last question we have, and it's a really important question, is um, did you eliminate the breeding site? And what that means is we ask you, once you've said, I found a place that could hold water, like a tire, um, uh, it says, can you actually dump it out? And if you dump out the water, you're protecting your community from disease because you're eliminating that place for mosquito moms to lay their eggs. And that's super important. So you can't eliminate a whole pond in a park. So you'd say no. But if you can throw away a piece of trash or dump out a plant pot or dump out a tire, you can say yes. And that data is really important because it helps us understand how people are learning about how to protect themselves from mosquito diseases. Okay, and there, here's some people here dumping out containers, dumping out an old bucket, dumping out a tire, and protecting their community from having more mosquitoes hatch and turn into biting females that will then bite you. Okay, at the end, you can send your mosquito data. You can also, you'll also get to collect all the pictures that you've taken and you can look at them in the app. So you'll have a record of all the signs that you've done. So the last thing I wanted to mention is that we are having a spare tire blitz. Now, I think I told you there's all kinds of places where you can find your mosquitoes in irrigation ditches. You can find them in ponds. You can find them in plant pots. You can find them in trash. But one favorite place, especially for those nasty 80s mosquitoes that Liliana was talking about, is in tires. And so we are doing a fun blitz right now where we're asking people to find all the tires they can and see if there's mosquitoes in them and record them. And so this is information that we will give you. Uh, maybe my friend Cassie can put this in the chat so that you can get this information. But we're gonna have a webinar on Thursday. If you're interested, you can come learn about our blitz. You can uh, just download the app and collect the data. And this is a weird little picture. I realize it doesn't work very well, but you know what a seesaw is, right? Where you sit and you go right back and forth. Well, this is a seesaw I saw yesterday and I'm in Brazil right now, I'm visiting there. And here there are lots of diseases that people get far more than in the US. And they're very careful about tires. So do you see those two dots on that piece of tire they put on the bottom of that, uh, on that seesaw? Well, they drilled holes in it so that the water will not get captured in there so that that tire cannot be used as a mosquito habitat. So I thought that was really pretty fun because you will not find that in the States. We're just not used to that yet. But because of the work that Liliana and Gregory are doing in LA, getting people to understand the dangers, I think more and more people will be able to do this now. Okay. So we hope you'll participate in our spare tire blitz around the world. And uh, we, we'd love you to take pictures of what you're doing, take pictures of the work you're doing. You can write a little story. You can have your kids write a story about what they're doing. We'll, post, we'll publish it on the NASA Globe Observer website. That'll be really, I think, pretty fun. So please uh, consider uh, taking the time to monitor and look at spare tires, discarded tires on the landscape and be part of our spare tire blitz. And this picture I put up Gregory and Liliana for you because I'm right now here in Brazil and I'm working with a scientist who developed a week, here Zika is, a big is the big dangerous disease besides dengue. And so we created a Zika bus. And I think your, look at my pictures on here. Your bus looks so much cooler on the inside, really neat. But we are here now and we are working on this bus and they have a, some very nice exhibits, uh, not so many microscopes uh, that you have, but you, they do have some really interesting um, 
uh, ex exhibits that they have on the floor that people can walk on. And uh, they have some movies you can sit in the, in the seats and watch the movies. And we have uh, some of the very similar kinds of things. So um, Gregory and Leanna, I'm gonna be contacting you to find out more about your really cool bus, your SWAT bus, because I just think it's so exciting what you're doing. Okay, that's all I have to say. Uh, there I am with the Mosquito Dipper. And I really hope that the, you might have some questions. I'm gonna stop my sharing right now. And I think we're ready to go. And yes, our buses do go to schools. So where we are right now, I'm in South Brazil and people live in rural areas. So they're, they're really far away from you know, universities or libraries. So this can go out into the countryside and educate everywhere, but they also go to the schools right here in town. And I would imagine, is that the same also, Gregory and Liliana, do you also go to schools or do you just um, go to uh, places in the community? Yeah, you know what, we actually uh, get to go to all the, all these different schools and events all throughout LA County. So yeah, we do have that privilege as well. So it's a definitely unique experience, just kind of like what you experienced as well, Dr. Uh, Rusty, so yeah. Yeah, yours is cooler though, I have to say. The inside of your bus is just awesome. So thank you for sharing that. And I hope, I will email you. I wanna hear more about what you're doing. Definitely will, I'm looking forward to it. Thank you, doctor. Thank you. So everyone, we're gonna go into our Q&A session now. Uh, thank you, Dr. Lowe, Greg, and Liliana for such an amazing presentation. And um, I think I'm gonna see mosquitoes in a different eye when I spot them <laughs> around my walks and are inside the house now. Um, but I did see some questions in the chat. Um, one of them was, oh, which country in the world has the most mosquitoes observed? If any of you might know the answer. <laughs> <laughs> um, I can't, I, you know, that's a really hard question and I'm not sure I can answer it well, but um, in general, you have a lot of mosquitoes in the tropics. And this is because the tropics, you know, it's, it's hot year round, so they can live year round um, in lots of parts of the US. Um, even in LA, there is a mosquito season where you have more mosquitoes and then less mosquitoes. But in some of the places that you are here in the tropics, you have them year round. So the populations get bigger, bigger, bigger. And then they, you know, and then maybe they die to disease and they come back. But I have to say, my, my husband, he worked up in Alaska and up in the Yukon in the northern part of Canada. And the mosquitoes there were really big and there were thousands and thousands of them. So, you know, I'm not sure I can answer that question properly, but I think that um, they're pretty much a problem just about everywhere and on every continent except for Antarctica, that I do know. Thank you, let's see. Um, in our Q&A portion, I see what type of blood do mosquitoes like most? Oh, so that's, that's an interesting question because yeah, the, the, right now scientists are still trying to figure out if there is like certain a specific blood type that they like. But one thing for sure, what, what they do like, what they do find attractive is gonna, where they're attracted to is gonna be pheromones, body sweat, uh, carbon dioxide, uh, blood. And so those are all, all the stuff that attract mosquitoes. So definitely uh, there's no specific blood type, but something that scientists are still working on. Okay, good to know. And then if anybody has any other questions, feel free to put it in the chat or in the Q&A section. Um, another question I see from Rainy, do lemongrass and garlic really repel mosquitoes? I'll answer that because I had a student that actually tested all those things and she got a big science prize that's gonna pay for her to go to college. So isn't, it was just, a, it was a high school student and she did this work and she looked at those, the, the word I use is aromatic. They're, they're smelly, you know, smelly plants. And so yes, lemongrass is a smelly plant. Garlic is a smelly plant. And yes, it, in fact, there are these, um, there are plants that do repel mosquitoes. They are not maybe 100% like something like DEET, you know, a, a chemical, because those actually go ahead and kill the mosquitoes, but um, they don't like the smell, they don't, it repels them. 
And I think maybe, maybe I grew up with citronella candles every night. My mom would burn these candles to keep the mosquitoes away when we were eating dinner. Um, but yes, uh, these things do work. Um, they, um, but they're maybe not quite as effective, but they are much safer. And so there's a lot of interest in trying to build better uh, and more safe, um, less chemically, less chemicals um, for repellents. Those are good questions. Yes, these are great questions. Um, another one I see is, uh, what is the best mosquito repellent we can get? Mm. Is this a good question for you guys, uh, Gregory or Liliana? Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, actually, Liliana, do you want to see it? you unmute yourself if you want to chime on in? Sure. So the, we don't necessarily recommend a specific brand um, of mosquito repellent. What we you want to look for is the ingredient. So there are four ingredients that are EPA approved, which include beet, the carotid, oil of lemon, eucalyptus, and IR3535. But not just the ingredient, you want to make sure that it has at least 20% of the ingredient or above. And that's because I want you to think of it similar to sunblock. The higher the SPF, the more protective we are throughout the day. And it goes the same with insect repellent. Now, if you purchase D at 20% and it doesn't necessarily work for you, try a different ingredient. One ingredient might work for me, but it might not, but it might not work for Dr. Lowe, and it might not work for, for Greg. So it just really depends on the person. We recommend trying the different brands, trying the different ingredients, but the important thing is looking at the ingredient and the percentage. And, and I that learned. Was actually, Thank you. That was great. Yes, and I was going to say that that's actually one of uh, eucalyptus was one of the questions um, if it if it works in repelling mosquitoes. So it, it does. Okay, one last question I see in our Q and A. Um, uh, do let me see. Okay, do those mosquitoes arrive um, at U.S. from different continents, reproduce, and get hybrid and create kind of super mosquitoes? <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like a terrible science fiction movie, doesn't it? Yeah, you know, um, that's a really, really good question. And um, I do not know of any hybridization that's happened. But I do know that what has happened is some of these um, new arrival mosquitoes are able to outcompete the original mosquitoes that were here, the native mosquitoes. So they kind of take over. And mosquitoes don't need to hybridize to become scary because they evolve over time, they adapt to their environment. And so for instance, this in mosquitoes, the 80s Egypti mosquito, one of those bad ones, that Liliana was talking about um, in the US, some of those mosquitoes now are able to overwinter and um, sort of over the, over the course of the year. And this is not a capability that they have in their native, native environment. So they're getting climatized to our environment and becoming um, more successful. So that is a little bit of scary. Uh, and I, okay, I love this question about the bees from Africa. Yes, the bees from Africa, oh my gosh, they do hybridize and they're hurting, you know, they're hurting our honeybee populations. But I, I can't say that it's not the same with mosquitoes, luckily. Yeah, yeah. Can I answer another question though, really quickly? Because someone said, are mosquitoes bad? And I wanted to answer that because people always think about mosquitoes being bad, but I also wanted to say that mosquitoes are also good because um, most mosquitoes don't bite people. You know, it's only a very few of those 3000 species that are actually bite people. And of those, maybe only a small percentage, maybe two or 3% can actually cause disease. But uh, mosquitoes play an important role in the ecosystem because they pollinate just like bees do. And they, are also, uh, they also provide important food for our amphibians, our frogs, and other organisms, aquatic organisms. And so of course, then they feed birds and bats. So um, mosquitoes aren't all bad, even though you might think so if you have a sleepless night going like this. And yes, they are pollinators. Yeah, and, and just to kind of add on something, like if you're having like sick with light, like Dr. Lowe is recommend, like kind of talking about, and we always recommend just putting a little fan next to you 
turn it on because mosquitoes are really weak flyers. They're so weak that they only fly uh, a mile per hour. So they definitely, if you have a fan point in your direction, it'll blow a mile of the way for you. Without chemicals, that's great. <laughs> Hey everyone, I think we have answered all the questions. So let's go to our next portion where we're gonna have our uh, giveaway for today's program. Um, Shirley, there is yes. one more question. Um, okay. I thought it was interesting. Do mosquitoes carry a specific disease or can it be multiple or many different diseases? You want to take that, Gregory? Yeah, yeah, okay, awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's, uh, definitely. So, there, uh, first thing, like, first thing to think about is that there's so many different kinds of mosquitoes. Get an idea. There's three thousand different types of mosquitoes, and all the different types of mosquitoes. Some of them will carry different diseases. Uh, like for example, like the Aedes mosquito will carry Zika, and then the uh, uh, mosquito will carry West Nile. Anopheles will carry malaria, and and some of these mosquitoes can carry more diseases than just that one. So yes, a lot of mosquitoes carry different types of diseases. Sure. These are all such great questions. <laughs> we're learning a lot. Um, okay, so now we're going to go to our giveaway section. And we are going to ask two questions from our presentation today. After we announce the question, we will count to three. If you know the answer, please use the raise hand button on the menu bar. If you're the first one to raise your hand and answer the question correctly, you will be rewarded with our prize today. Uh, we have two sets of microscopes to give out. All right, and this is limited to participants in the United States. Um, all right, so as soon as everyone is ready, and so we can start. Um, so Greg and Liliana, do you want to start with your question? And then Dr. Lowe can go next. Certainly. Yeah, so our question is, can anyone tell us the four stages of the mosquito life cycle? Ooh. Okay, we're gonna to count to three first. So please have your hands down. And after we count to three, then you can raise your hand. And all the panelists, please keep your eyes on the participants list. <laughs> all right, Shirley, you're ready. Uh, when you're ready to count, just go ahead. Okay, so I'm gonna start counting, ready? One, two, three. Oh, Gloria, wow. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Gloria's right there. <laughs> All right, I'm going to unmute her. Go ahead, Gloria. For my kindergarten class. Okay, so egg, larva, pupa, adult. Very good. Hey, we're so excited. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I'll take it to my kindergarten class. Yay. Wonderful. Oh, yay. <laughs> Congratulations, Gloria. All right, so that was our first giveaway, our first microscope. And um, our next question is going to be from Dr. Lowe, and I will be counting to, I'm gonna count down this time <laughs> from three. And then when it's done, um, Dr. Lowe will ask her question, and then you can put in your raised hand. Okay, ready? So three, two, one. Okay. Not all mosquitoes bite. Who bites? Did anyone see who raised their hand first? I want to say Marcia, but I'm not 100% sure. <laughs> <laughs> Should we just go with Marcia first? Sounds good. All right. Sounds good, everyone. <laughs> okay, I'm going to go ahead and do that. And um, please email the address that, that was put in the chat uh, for our winners, and then you'll be receiving your microscope. All right, so let's go to our next slide. And congratu congratulations to our winners for the microscopes. Um, Shirley. Did yes. Marcia had a chance to say the answer? Oh, oh, not yet. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I, I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> okay, Marcia, what was the answer? <laughs> um, it was the female who bites, not the male. Good yes. job. Good job. All right. 
Oh, well, congratulations, Marcia and Gloria again. <laughs> All right. So now we're gonna now we're going to our next section uh, okay. for our next slide. Give me one second. Okay. Uh, okay. So while we're waiting for the slide to pop up, thank you so much, everyone, for participating in our presentation today and joining us, and also in our giveaway. Uh, we hope you had fun with the questions. Um, our program is coming to an end today. Thank you again, Dr. Lowe, Greg, and Liliana for joining us today for a wonderful presentation. We hope you enjoyed our program and learned a few new things about mosquitoes and how we can help stop their spread, making our neighborhoods more friendly for walks and exploration. And we have so many awesome programs and events this week to celebrate our planet and Citizen Science Month. First, please join us for a special Earth Month program on monarch butterflies with National Park Services. You don't need to register for this event, just visit LAPL's Facebook or YouTube at LA Public Library, and the program will be at 4 p.m. For more information, you can visit our LAPL Maysai events page, and the link is up where it says bit.ly. We can also scan the QR code. Then you can join us in person. So this will be for our next slide. Okay, you can join us in person for a, a program on Saturday, April 23rd at 10 a.m. Uh, Pacific Standard Time at Hanson Dam Recreation Area in Lakeview Terrace for our first 2022 Earth Day Bio Blitz. And this, pro uh, this program is an in-person program. You can register to attend at uh, the link that you see on the screen right there. And then please tune in. Oh, let's see. Oh, then we'll go to the next slide now. So please tune in next Tuesday for our last program uh, for our NASI Tuesday program series. It will be April 26th for our final program. Our guest speakers will take us on a virtual tour to meet many rescued animals in the Star Eco Station an environmental science museum, exotic wildlife rescue center, and a haven for endangered and illegally trafficked exotic animals confiscated by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, um, also short for FWS. Get an inside scoop on how wildlife trafficking is affecting Southern California and some of the most popular species that are found by U.S. Fish and Wildlife. You will also find out ways you can help stop wildlife trafficking. And this program is suitable for ages eight and up. If you have not registered for the event, please sure that you do. Again, we're going to put the registration QR code and the bit.ly link on the screen. Okay, next slide. All right, before you leave, we have one more question for everyone today. Please tell us one thing that you learned or discovered from today's program. And you can just type it in the chat. So one thing that you learned from today's presentation. Let's see, so we, we're getting comments. Um, I learned a lot during this class. Wonderful, thank you. And lemongrass does work. <laughs> it's great learning about natural ways that we can repel mosquitoes. And we're getting some thumbs up. Yes, there are so many programs this week. Um, it's also Earth Day on Friday, the 22nd, and the month of April is Earth Month. So lots of wonderful programs. Right. So with the comments, I don't see any more coming in. Um, one last thing I wanted to mention was that after today's program, you will be sent some of the resources that we talked about today, along with the recording of today's excellent presentation. We hope to see you again next week for our final NASI Tuesday program. So next Tuesday, again at 4 p.m. Thank you and goodbye, everyone.